Okay, here we go. Last letter for the week. Letter 13. Next week, I'm going to read a couple of these a day so I don't have to sit in my basement for hours reading letters. Oops, sorry. Here we go. My dear Wormwood, it seems to me that you take great many pages to tell me a very simple story. The long and short of it is that you have let the man slip through your fingers. The situation is very grave, and I really see no reason why I should try to shield you from the consequences of your inefficiency. A repentance and a renewal of what the other side call grace on the scale which you described is a defeat of the first order. It amounts to a second conversion and probably on a deeper level than the first. So this is bad for screw tape and wormwood. Our patient has uh, repented and come back to Jesus. As you ought to have known, the asphyxiating cloud which prevented your attacking the patient on his walk back from the old mill is a well-known phenomenon. It is the enemy's most barbarous weapon and generally appears when he is directly present to a patient under certain modes, yet not fully classified. Some humans are permanently surrounded by it and therefore inaccessible to us. But now for your blunders on your own, and now for your blunders, on your own showing, you first of all allowed the patient to read a book he really enjoyed because he enjoyed it and not in order to make clever remarks about it to his new friends. In second place, you allowed him to walk down to the old mill and have tea there, a walk through the country he really likes and taken alone. In other words, you allowed him two real positive pleasures. You were so ignorant as to not see, were you so ignorant as to not see the danger of this? The characteristic of pains and pleasures is that they are unmistakably real and therefore, as far as they go, give the man who feels them a touchstone of reality. Thus, if you had been trying to damn your man by the romantic method, by making him a kind of child herald or Werther, those were famous poets, submerged in self-pity for imaginary distress, you would try to protect him at all costs from any real pain. Because, of course, five minutes genuine toothache would reveal the romantic sorrows for the nonsense they were and unmask your whole stratagem. But you were trying to damn your patient by the world, that is, by palming off vanity, bustle, irony, and expensive tedium as pleasures. How can you have failed to see that a real pleasure was the last thing you ought to have let him meet? Didn't you foresee that it would just kill, by contrast, all the trumpery which you had been so laborious, laboriously teaching him to value? And that sort of pleasure which the book and the walk gave him was the most dangerous of all. That it would peel him, peel off from his sensibility the kind of crust you have been forming on it and make him feel that he was coming home, recovering himself. As a preliminary to detaching him from the enemy, you wanted to detach him from himself and had made some progress in doing so. Now all that is undone. Of course, I know that the enemy also wants to detach men from themselves, but in a different way. Remember always that he really likes the little vermin and sets them absurd value on the distinctness of each and every one of them. That's, he's talking about us, that God likes us and wants us to have value independently of others. When he talks of their losing their selves, he only means abandoning the clamor of self-will. Jackson, stop, please. Once they have done that, he really gives them back all their personality and boasts. I'm afraid sincerely that when they are wholly his, they will be more themselves than ever. So they're saying that God is telling people that when they fully commit to him, they're more themselves than when they're not fully committed to God. Hence, while he is delighted to see them sacrificing even their innocent wills to his, he hates to see them drifting away from their own nature for any other reason. And we should always encourage them to do so. The deepest likings and impulses of any man are the raw material, the starting point with which the enemy has furnished him. To get him away from those things is therefore always a point gained. Even in things indifferent, it is always desirable to substitute the standards of the world or convention or fashion for a human's own real likings or dislikings. What he's saying is we want to get the world's standards to be what our patient thinks is correct. So it doesn't matter if our patient likes something. If the world doesn't like it, if it's not up to the world standards, then we don't want him to like it. 
I myself would carry this very far. I would make it a rule to eradicate from my patient any strong personal taste, which is not actually a sin. Even if it is something quite trivial, such as a fondness for a county cricket or collecting stamps or drinking cocoa, such things, I grant you, have nothing of virtue in them. But there is a sort of innocence and humility and self-forgetfulness about them, which I distrust. The man who truly and disinterestedly enjoys any one thing in the world for its own sake and without caring two pence what other people say about it is by that very fact forearmed against some of our most subtlest modes of attack. You should always try to make the patient abandon the people or food or books he really likes in favor of the best people, the right food, and the important books. I've known a human defend defended from strong temptations to social ambition by a still stronger taste for tripe and onions. So what he's saying is, remember before, we're trying to get him to be two people at a time. Like, I'm going to be this person here and this person here. If we can convince him that those friends that he actually really likes aren't cool or aren't up to standards world-wise or whatever, we want him to avoid those. We want him to avoid what he actually likes for what the world would want him to do. It remains to consider how we can retrieve this disaster. The great thing is to prevent his undoing, his doing anything. As long as he does not convert it into action, it does not matter how much he thinks about this new repentance. Let the little brute wallow in it. Let him, if he has any bent that way, write a book about it. That is often an excellent way of sterilizing the seeds which the enemy plants in the human soul. Let him do nothing. Let him do anything but act no amount of piety in his imagination and affection will harm him harm us if we can keep it out of his will as one of the humans has said active habits are strengthened by repetition but passive ones are weakened the more often he feels without acting the less he will be able to ever act and in the long run the less he will be able to feel so we're ending here our patient has gotten has repented again but Screw tape's goal is to keep him from acting. Or sorry, Wormwood's goal. Screw tape says let him do anything but act. He's okay if he sits idly on this new decision that he's made, but he's going to be dangerous if he actually gets up and does something for God. So that is our last letter for the week. I hope you liked them all.